no holes barred. Do you yeah. have to sing a first cap song for Italy? So Italy, uh, you shave your head. Stop the lights. They Did give you do you that? Di- they I give can't you, imagine that. They give you a different sort of haircut. So you could have a mohawk or you could have one half completely shaved. And, and your look was? My look was, geez, what was it? I think it was just sort of one line across the top. No <laughs> way. <laughs> the middle, Completely bald. It was just like, yeah, just here and then leave two bits. You're joking. So, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think you agreed to do that before you leave the show tonight. <laughs> <That's> hilarious. <laughs> Joe presents House of Rugby, United Rugby Championship, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of the four Irish provinces. Hello and welcome back to the latest episode of House of Rugby URC. Now the Six Nations is well and truly over and we have plenty of URC action to get tucked into later. Obviously Jason is missing, I'm sitting in the main seat for this show. We have a great new presenter and old friend of the show as well, Lindsay Pete is here. Thank you very much, my loan spell is over. (laughs) Full time here now and I'm absolutely buzzing and the privilege to be part of the team for the rest of the season, so thank you very much. Can't wait to hear everything you have to give to the show, but we also have a really good guest international for Italy. Um, he played for Leinster, played for Benetton, played for Zebra, he has it all. Uh, Ian McGinley, thanks very much for joining us. No problem, Greg. Delighted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to list off all your clubs there. It's just like, oh, there's no so worry. many, but um, we'll get stuck into you later. We have plenty of questions coming up for you. Um, but first of all, I want to talk to you about, obviously, Italy's win last week. It's still quite fresh in everyone's mind. I think everyone's delighted that Italy did so well, but you have more knowledge than everyone. Um, what, what did you make of it all? I was just so happy. <laughs> I think, you know, you were saying there, Lindsay, you cried and, you know, I, I was close to having a tear uh, as well. But I think it's just, I think I, I said with with, uh, with Virgin that it, it's such an important thing for the competition and, you know, there's so much grilling going on with Italian rugby and quite rightly, you know, it hasn't been positive. There's been a lot of... Uh, problems and you know 30 plus games losing uh is is not good and you know i've been a, been a part of some of those games and it's it's really really hard but i think in the manner in which they won and they really did italy deserve to win that game and, and they played really positive rugby and they were accurate in in their exits and defense was really good and, and that last try by Padovani and the break by Capuzzo, you know. Yeah, that's how you were now pronouncing it. <laughs> yeah. I was saying Capuzzo the whole time. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of people saying Capuzzo, so yeah. okay. Capuzzo, but he's a uh, small little guy of 12 stone, but he, geez, he can, he can move. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just good for the competition. Yeah. Are you kind of annoyed that people are saying that Wales played poorly rather than Italy played well? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a bit of both. Definitely, I think Wales are in transition and PVAC's under a huge amount of pressure. It's amazing how it can change in 12 months, you know. Um, but I think, you know, Wales have to deal with with their issues leading into the World Cup now. Italy can only focus on uh, on themselves. But I think if you really go back and, and, and watch the game, I think, as I said, Italy defended really well. Their ruck pressure, they've changed, I think, their attitude in that. Um, too many teams were just getting quick quick rock ball against them and it's so hard to defend against if you've England, France, Ireland that just get quick ball the whole time so they put a huge focus on that and yeah I, I definitely do think that they deserve to win that game yeah yeah, 100%. I'm probably biased but <laughs> <laughs> but do you I'm think just, with all the chat like obviously there was talk about bringing in South Africa and, and Italy coming out and you know they weren't really worth their place and, that, and that's hard for a team because obviously um I've seen glimpses you're trying to always catch up on teams that are quick and we'll, we'll talk about the women's and we've seen that and that but do you think Finally, that result was kind of two fingers up to the rest of the world to say, we're here, you know, we deserve this chance and we can bring something. Yeah, or? pretty much. I mean, it, it, it is one game at the end of the day and consistency is 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 really important. So I think the the, the challenge now for this crop of Italian players and, and team is that you, you, you have to back up what they've done now. So people are going to be expecting things. It's not as if that game was won in Rome and that game is won in Cardiff as a difficult place to, yeah. to win. So they have to build on it. There's no point now in you know, a home game against Ireland losing by 40 points and, you know, that that just shouldn't happen anymore. Yeah. So hopefully they at least, you know, uh, with the new coach and Kieran Crowley now have started to, to yeah. generate something. Watch this space. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I think it's just great for rugby in general now and shuts everyone up saying Italy aren't good enough. But we'll talk more about that in a while. Um, we want to talk about the women. So the women kicked yes, off their uh, Six Nations campaign in the RDS. Unfortunately, uh, they lost 27-19. But I actually thought they played pretty well. What did you make of it? You were at the game. I do. I... Um... I'm so many mixed emotions more and so if any of the girls listen and I'm sure they're not because they're like she's retired we're sick of listening to her but I'm sending out a lot of love and positivity this morning 
said during the week this was going to be a process stick to the process and believe and that's my message to them going into France next week and um, I thought we showed glimpses of brilliance you know I was saying if we could move you know what is a big you know Welsh pack around get space for our really electric exciting backline then we can get tries and when we did that like we seen Murphy Crows um, try uh, we seen Stacey Flood you know when we did that and we got it to the players who can play ball not that our forwards can't I thought we showed glimpses of brilliance um, I thought where we probably lost the game you cannot ship 22 points in the second half of any game of rugby let's not even go into international no team shipping 22 points are going to you know have a hope of winning the game and I thought Wales uh, were allowed to kind of inflict their you know superiority as regards their pack weight and their aggression um, and we kind of probably seen glimpses of the results of their contracts I felt I felt their fitness in the last probably definitely 20 20 minutes I thought showed yeah. to be honest well just to expand on that people probably don't realize that Wales only in the last couple of months have gone yes. professional the Wales women's team mm -hmm. and you feel like that was shown in the last 20 minutes with fitness yeah I definitely see it like we beat Wales 45 nil last year away uh, in Cardiff Farms Park so to now come on the back of results lose in 1927 um yeah, I did see glimpses. I thought they were more mobile. Uh, they definitely had 600 plus caps. And though we've some very skillful players, I think it's game management, it's little decisions. Um, they scored a great mall try. I thought, you, again, we competed on our five metre and we threw a pot up at the front, whereas, you know, Wales went to the back. Now, if you can get your mall going at the back with less people and it gains momentum against a pack who have... Um, you know, superiority, like they're much heavier. You're such a you're, forward man. Oh, so you're, on the, <laughs> you're on the back foot. You're like, you might as well be on the ropes in the box. You're like, yeah. just get off me, you know, so. Yeah, I thought yeah. that looking at, obviously I'm a back, so I wouldn't know too much about the forwards, but I thought Wales just started to bully the Irish yes. pack towards the end of the game, like at the ruck, and the girls just weren't able to fall around and they just were getting these, they were just getting the game line easier than they were in the first half, I thought. But I was actually really impressed with the back line, the Irish back line, the yeah. way they were moving the ball. The skills from Lucy Mulhall to Stacey Flood to Amy Lee Murphy Crow. Yeah. Did, Did you, you see Stacey's whip pass? Unbelievable skip pass. Now, I don't out. want to give her too much credit because you know what? I won't get her through in or out that door. But um, <laughs> like I've played with Stacey and she's an absolute baller. And, and that's the thing, you know, that's probably our contracts as well. The fact that, you know, Stacey and the girls are contract at sevens and that contact time and that, you know, focus on their skill level. You know, we can see glimpses of that. And, you know, if we can get that, maybe maybe it's a question now in the 15s. Can, yeah. Because, Greg, you know, they've had three camps. What do you do in three camps? You're going to cover your attack, your D, your set piece. Yeah. Very little time. And I know, um, I think in his post-match, Greg McWilliams alluded to the fact that having that constant contact time with the contracts, you know, accelerates, you know, that improvement. And, you know, we might need to look at that because I did see glimpses of um, of those contracts and the results for Wales. Yeah. And I think they had a point to prove yesterday to kind of say we're worthy of these contracts, you know, and they were, yeah, they were fairly jubilant now yeah. to. Well, Ian, what do you think? But You've been obviously all over the world playing rugby. Do you think the Irish women should be put on full contracts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, I've had a bit of experience with watching the the Italian women uh, over there, and they've had quite good success over the last few years. So, no, definitely, I think when you have six and a half thousand people uh, in the RDS, you know, that's all you need to know that there's yeah. obviously a massive, mm -hmm. uh, massive interest and. You know the skill set is is there. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And you know, uh, a couple of the tries that were scored were were Incredible, fantastic. Yeah. You know, um, but I think you know, as you're saying there, Lindsay, I think it's just those sort of game management type of things just that that were lacking. And then discipline was a big thing. I think for for well, Ireland, you know, four, I think it was either fourteen or sixteen penalties to yeah, five. It, it is no, no matter no matter what level you 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 play at. If you, uh, I was coaching my team yesterday, and we gave about seven away in the space of about 10 minutes and you're just yeah. constantly on the on the on the back foot you can't you can't do it but that's all it's all learning curve and and it's it's a completely new different er, era for you know uh for the co coaching staff and, and players so mm. they will definitely learn from that yeah. and they will only get better yeah yeah 100 percent. so they're up against france next week yeah that's a big mm. you know you're france away we're playing in the Stad uh, Ernest Waldron, it's in Toulouse. I would mm -hmm. think a full crowd during a World Cup cycle. The French are really building momentum. They've just come off the back of a Six Nations win and I think that'll feed into the women's game. They've, they're have they just a huge rugby nation and yeah. they get behind their women fantastically. So short turnaround, the lads have to travel. Um, but look, as I said, believe, stick to the process. Yeah. We're going to get there. I was trying to think, trying to put my mind in the, in the mindset of being in the Irish women's camp. Would they be aiming for arguably third place after England and France were clearly... Absolutely. Yeah. Like England won 57-5 uh, yesterday away to Scotland and France will play Italy today mm -hmm. in, in uh, Grenoble. Grenoble. 
Um, so I'd be interested to see that result. France have made a couple of changes. They don't travel well. The Italians are obviously going to the World Cup at the expense of us. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so we'll see. But I would have targeted, like if we we're going to quantify, I would have targeted three home results, three home wins, you know. Yeah. So if we can get a performance away in France on the back of this um not poor results, but an unexpected result, you know, undeserving result, I think, really. Um, if we can get a performance and then target the two home wins, I'd be, I would be yeah. happy now. And I don't know if you have much knowledge of the in, in, Italian women's rugby setup, but what do you think it's compared to the Irish women's setup here? Would you have much knowledge of that? Yeah, um, I mean, there's definitely big support given from the from the federation towards the the women's game. I think you can. You can see it in, the, in their results over the last few years that there is definitely uh, good publicity about it and, and everything like that. So mm. I know that there has been the, the issues, um, you know, since I've moved back a year and a half or so ago. Yeah. Yeah, you're obviously getting uh, <laughs> hearing the news and everything like that. There's never really been much of, of that with Italy. It just seemed to have been a lot more uh, supported in any time that we had. Uh, sort of Six Nations camps with uh, the national team. There was always the women's team that were right with us, you know. It really? was uh, not necessarily on the same pitch, but, you know, we were all near enough the same sort of training complex and everything like that. So it definitely was, uh, well, pretty well supported. That's yeah. cool, yeah. That you'd be in this, it would be like having the two teams out in Blanchardstown. Yeah, yeah, it was sort of like a, an area down in Rome that was yeah. a, an old Olympic um, area that you that you trained and yeah, mm. you would have uh, different teams, whether it was the sevens, uh, the, the, the 15s and, and the women's would be generally in and around there. Uh, so yeah. Cool. I'd love to see more of that, you know, that because, you know, as a club, like, you know, our, our grassroots club, um, like in railway, the, the lads would always be there. And I think, you know, we seen Brian O'Driscoll at the game yesterday with his young daughter, mm -hmm. um, which was huge. And I'd love to see, um, I'd love to see the lads just maybe tweet a little bit more or even if they could get out to games if they've daughters. And I know it's hard because they've come off the back of the Six Nations, but I think just that family vibe that everyone's yeah. behind one another, I'd love to see that. So if any of the lads are listening, uh, <laughs> now tweet now and again, it'd be good. But um, yeah, I was going to say that as well. It'd be nice to have more of a family thing that every, t every team kind of supports each other because oh, we all absolutely. obviously support the 15s. Yeah. Even when it comes to the 7s. We're but even seeing you guys in the Olympics, the yeah. we loved it, you know, and we were so proud of you. And, yeah. you know, you're, you're trying to tweet, but even like, I'm a different for voice notes or videos on WhatsApp, you know, just to get people behind, you know, yeah. just to let them, show them a bit of love and let them know we're, I think, we're all behind. I think it's exposure to it as well. I mean, necessarily 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have, you know, in the media, it never yeah. really was was out that much. So I think now we're in a, a stage where people, everyone should should know exactly who's playing. You know, it's, it's yeah. easy to get all that information. Absolutely. And, and if you've got a, a weather, you know, the weather like it was the other day yeah. and it's just down in the RDS, what's the difference in, in going to a Use game like that? Use the social and, event, exactly. Yeah. Have a beer, bring your family. Mm -hmm. um, like there was great family events it was an absolute brilliant buzz so mm -hmm. to any of the 6,113 that came to the game yesterday or anyone who tuned in you're absolutely brilliant that's amazing yeah, 6,000 people and you mentioned Bod there he actually presented the jerseys to the girls the night before yeah which, which was, was huge for cool. them um, obviously he's a legend of Irish rugby and yeah. you know to come in and, and give his time up and um, again the girls feel seen they feel valued, valued and a part of the overall you know, rugby family. Yeah. So, so we're obviously going to move on quick, but one thing that you mentioned before this was that the, even the girls' names were on plaques and stuff in the dressing yeah, room. Yeah, in the dressing room, I've seen the RFU kind of video. So, um, say, Avian Riley, congrats on your first cap. You know, you could see Avian Riley, and underneath it was Clan, you know, family, and everyone had Clan under their That's name. So cool. And it was beside their jersey. And again, I was so emotional. Yes, I was crying there and watching it, but it's just brilliant. And I just think it's the little things. It's like, the little things. Yeah. And it's, you know, the culture seems to be huge from Greg and uh, a lot of love coming in there. So I think the rugby will come. Just stick with each other and we'll get there. Yeah, that's Greg Mike Williams, by the way, not yes. me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're going to move on now to the URC and we're going to start with a provincial derby between uh, Connacht and Leinster. The first meeting of three in the next month between the two provinces. And it was Leinster who took the spoils at the sports ground. It was. It was 45A, wasn't it? Yes. Um, what, did you get to watch it? I did, yeah. What did yeah, you yeah. make of it? It was fairly dramatic uh, first two and a half minutes with a yellow card and a, and, and a red card then. Um, yeah. Yellow for Leinster, red for Connacht with Tom Daly. Um, taking it for a high a high shot to Kieran Frawley. So uh, sort of a, a tale of two halves and Connacht were, were in it uh, at, at, at the half halfway mark. But Leinster just went from third gear to fifth gear yeah. and just sort of completely blew them away with, with an extra man. So um, I think no one probably, <laughs> Leo Cullen and Leinster, they'll be bitterly disappointed with how they played uh, initially but then managed to 
sort of finish finish Connacht off. So I think mm-hmm. from a, a Connacht point of view, it's really frustrating because they're just so up and down and they've got so much potential. And Andy Friend, you know, seems a really good coach uh, and, and really well respected over there. But they just need to get some consistency, yeah. especially if they're going to be playing Leinster again, you know, in a double header in, in Europe. Uh, you just need to find that consistency. Well, that's the thing. They have Leinster coming up, I think, the 8th of April. I could have that wrong. Whatever European, mm-hmm. European weekend's coming up, they have Leinster. But like... Connacht had all their internationals back playing, basically, Jack Harty back, and they didn't have Bundy playing, but they had a couple of internationals. Leinster had none of their internationals playing, really, mm-hmm. and they came away with six unanswered tries in the second half. But I think we we broached on this, and you can give us your opinion on this, like we broached it about a couple of weeks ago to say that it's, it is the depth, you know, when Leinster lose their internationals um, during their international window, they still have such a deep squad, like, like Hawkshaw come on, and he had such an impact, you know, but he came off the bench, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Tommy mm-hmm. O'Brien has gone from strength to strength, X under 20 uh, captain, so their depth of their squad and the fact then when, if Connacht lose anyone through injury or suspension now or their internationals are away, it does impact their consistency and then there's no depth of squad, you know, mm-hmm. so it'll be tough over the next couple of weeks for them. But hopefully we'll see. Obviously, Dooley will move over um, and Adam Borum, that'll hopefully help the quality of over there. But yeah, yeah. it's it's sort of the, the standard we're talking about in any squad now is not necessarily the 15 that takes yeah. the field, because when you when you get to latter stages of competitions, when you get to international breaks and windows, that's really where the strength of the, the team uh, yeah comes from um, and just yeah Leinster just have three players four yeah. players in every position it's 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 crazy the challenge for them is trying to keep a squad happy and how yeah. Leo Cullen has done that is is a, is a miracle in in management um, and they're just they're always going to be there or thereabouts you don't see it stopping yeah well they play like nearly 50 players a season yeah. I don't even think Connacht have 50 players signed no really. and I know you're saying it's actually uh, probably disappointed at their performance but considering Connacht have only lost one home game since 2019 it's mm. probably I would think it's one of those defining wins you know in a mm. championship winning season that it's you know it's those little we see it in soccer all the time that you know the ch- those challenging for the title kind of trip up on those who are fighting for relegation not mm-hmm. that you know Connacht or anything like that but mm-hmm. it's just a tough place to go and regardless of how inconsistent they are mm-hmm. um, I still think it's a good win and the, the patience of Leinster to grind it out I know they oh yeah win. no I, I, absolutely and, and some of the tries they got at the end were fantastic. Were, were, were fantastic you know yeah. Brian's finish uh, Kieran Frawley you know I, I rate really highly yeah. I think he's a fantastic player it's just is he, is he going to be a, a 12 the whole time is he going to be a 10 yes. but he's he's so he's a really special time, player I think yeah and yeah. he needs that to make the next step really doesn't it if he wants to get into an Irish he needs consistency he's been in I know he's struggling mm. with some injuries and then positioning yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah. well just to, to give that fact again Connacht had lost just once at the sports ground since October and Leinster had not lost back-to-back away games since April 2019 um, and now they're playing each other again at the start of April in the European Cup do you think it will be the same again? In terms of scoreline? Yeah, score no, I don't think. I think you're, you're talking about two. I mean, it is a different competition. So you have a different vibe and everything like that. And I think Connacht will be a bit more bolstered with... Yeah, Bundyaki gives them so much as well. He, he's so important for them. So I don't... No, I don't think it'll be the the same scoreline. But at the same time, you think of the players that Leinster are going to be bringing, bringing, back. bringing back. But a uh, different occasion, different day. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. But I don't I don't think it'll be as yeah. big as, as, as that. I do think the red card played a lot in the Tom Daly going off because he's yeah. a he's a leadership uh, role in that team and him going off in the centre I think just opened the floodgates for people like Tommy O'Brien who was playing out of his skin mm. like he's playing so well he should arguably be near the Irish club like he won't oh absolutely it. and actually he's nicely but like I was yeah. watching him when he scored and I was like holy he's actually really bulked up now he's moving you fast know? he's well. moving yeah. fast and like not only that obviously over the last couple of weeks we've highlighted some of his try saving tackles and I'm like okay Tommy you're putting your hand up here you know you're yeah. jumping up and down to be noticed so um but that's positive from an Irish point of view that we've depth in squad. The provinces are doing so well and we're blooding new players at high level. But These guys um, sitting there, like Tommy Bryan sitting there, Frawley you mentioned, who are playing out of their skin. Uh, and there's just, they're not going to get into the Irish team because it's no, all they space. they haven't even gone into camp, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just competition, isn't it? That, yeah. That's, that's you know, you, you suppose for Ireland down the line when it comes to World Cup cycles, you know, is calling upon not necessarily these guys, but you know that that that's the thing. When we think of Stephen Donald, you know, mm. when he kicked the winning goal in was it twenty eleven for New Zealand. I mean, he was fishing a, a couple yeah. of weeks yeah. uh, before the World Cup final, but he was fourth choice. But he was still a quality player, and that's what Ireland have to yeah. get to. So it's just yeah, for Irish rugby, it's good that these players are just coming through, coming and it's through, just a conveyor yeah. belt, a massive. 
yeah. massive from there as well. A hundred percent. So looking forward to seeing them meet each other in the European Cup in a couple of weeks. Um, but moving on to another Irish province that played on the weekend, my uh, home team, Munster. They beat your team, Benetton, yeah. 51-22 in the renamed Musgrave Park. So um, it's not named Irish Independent Park anymore. It's gone back to Musgrave, funnily enough. Oh, so the three-year contract's up, yeah. Oh. I only learned that over the weekend because I thought someone made a mistake saying mm. Musgrave. No, famous facts boy. Grant. There we go. Yeah. yeah. On you. Um, so did you get, did you catch that game? I did. I'm coming across as a nerd here. That's how I'm watching all the games. We won't judge you. No, that's worry. all right. <laughs> you did his own. Um, no, I I I watch Benetton. Well, I watch the Italian teams mainly. Um, just to keep a, an interest with them. So, I mean, Munster. Uh, yeah. Again, it was it was a sloppy performance from from their point of view. But again, scoring mm. fifty. Plus points in Musgrave Park, they'll be they'll be happy enough. Uh, Healy was really good, kicked flawlessly off the yeah. tee. Yeah. Coombs think got man of the match as well, and he's he's another guy who's knocking at you know on the door of trying to get into an Irish back row, and he's a big big mm. unit that can move. And um, but you know Munster won't be fully happy with their accuracies, and I know from from Benetton's point of view they're going through a new cycle as well. Marco Bortolami's there, a new coach ex player, ex captain of, of of Italy. So they're going through a, a transition, uh, and they've they've lost a few on the bounce that's sort of pushing them down the table where they wouldn't want to be. So, uh, but I think Munster overall will be. Yeah, there was a couple of inaccuracies, but again, to get fifty plus points in Musgrave, they'll be happy. Enough. Yeah, they were. But I actually, I would agree with you. I didn't didn't think Munster played that well, coming off two poor performances in South Africa, and then. Mm. Obviously, they won by 30 points against Benetton, but it wasn't a very good performance. It didn't look like it. It wasn't no. clean. Benetton broke through the defence at least th two or three times, like cleanly. Yeah. So I don't know if Cle that... Clean is actually the word I wrote down. <laughs> when that it, yeah, when I was just doing notes or whatever, that it, it just wasn't slick. It wasn't, you know, there was a couple of over. I think there was an overthrow in the first half that didn't go to hand, the ball mm. bounced. And yeah, against maybe higher opposition on the day, you know, Munster will get punished for those sort of things. So they'll certainly, certainly have to... I think clean up a little bit on on their their basics and they're they're trying to play, but it's just again it just wasn't fully fully working. So, but again, if 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 it wasn't working, then they've gone with fifty plus points again. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a good complaint, isn't it? You it mentioned is a good Gavin complaint. Coombs, who is having the season of his life, mm -hmm. but he played in the second row. You did. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? Is no. that a positional move? Was it for Munster's benefit, or was it him trying to give him his versatility to say? A bit like Ty Byrne, I can play in the back row, I can play in the second um, row. Yeah, I suppose it's a good question. I don't, he's what, six, six, six? Yes, so he's big, not, big guy. He's not, he's not, you know, he's big enough to play in the second row. Um, I still think he's, he's good enough to compete in the back row mm. for Ireland and he gives, I mean, if you're going up against South Africa, France again, and, and you know, he's got a bit more development under his belt, I mean, to have Coombs play in could be yeah. a really valuable option. So I think... Ireland, I mean, there is a bit of a shortage in, in, in the second row, you know, particularly on the last uh, game day against Scotland, you know, when, two, we had injuries. when we had injuries. Is that something maybe that's been looked at? I I, I, I can't answer it. I don't know. But I yeah. still think he, he offers a huge amount to, to a back row. It's kind of a modern game now, isn't it? We're kind of deploying. And even like actually yesterday, Nick Lafardi and Sam Monaghan started and at club level, they would have played back row. So you now mm. kind of have your back five as nearly back row forwards that they're yeah. mobile, they're big. But it's a great point that you make about Coombs because we're you know talking about the depth of Ireland uh, and what we want to go into World Cup and playing those bigger Southern Hemisphere teams where it's just a war of attrition. You want the Gavin Coombs maybe in the in the back mm. row being able to kind of take those hits, give those hits, and you could give do, you a yeah. different dynamic. You know? and, and they're sort of I think you're talking about Ty Byrne and that's like they're hybrid sort of players. It's almost like a a 10, a 10 that can play 12, a 12 yes. that can play sort of a Kieran Frawley-esque, yeah. you know, yeah. being able to, to to mix a match. And if Coombs can do that, you know, it is another string to his bow. But um, I, I personally, I would still see him Same being a, a dominant, yeah, as, as a dominant eight, maybe as a six, you know, you don't, you don't know. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I still think that would be his best. Yeah, I definitely see him following that tight burn kind of hybrid, as you said there. But he scored the bonus point try for Munster. I don't think it was until the 65th minute until they got that. And then they kind of just steamrolled Benetton. Jack O'Sullivan mm -hmm. got in for a try. Uh, Damien Delande, twinkle toes down the touchline, got in for a try. Um, but an interesting point was Jake Flannery came on for Zebo, but Jake Flannery's after signing for Ulster for one year, which I thought was a weird move. Well, what do you make of that? Yeah, uh, a one I mean, year Ulster, contract. Ulster up there. They've got Billy Burns. Uh, I think I think they are. I know Ian Madigan is still there. Don't don't know what's uh, obviously happening, but Did Bill yeah, Johnson I suppose Bill well. so yeah. Johnson's up there. As Bill well. Johnson went from as well. Ulster a couple yeah. Of years ago, so. Oh yeah. So yeah, one year contracts are are not a. 
you dare say a bit of a rarity these days. So potentially it is a bit of a, a bit of a strange one. Zebo got a, a HIA as well. I think that's why he, he, he off, came yeah. off. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah. I I I I wouldn't know what the what the thinking is behind it. Uh, to be honest. So I mean, he, he obviously sees it as good uh, career choice for him to maybe you know put a bit of pressure on Billy Burns and the other the other yeah. guys that are there. So. Yeah, I just thought it was, it was a bit because he's playing really well. For, he's a Shannon man, same club as me, and mm. he plays in and out for Munster. And every time he comes on, he's really good. And I thought he'd be on a nice path at Munster there. Maybe he's just trying to go up and get some experience. But I can't see him really playing that much if you said Billy Burns is there, Bill Johnson's there, Ian Madigan's there. So I, d- I don't know. I might have to give him a text and see what he's thinking. <laughs> I but, think you need to, yeah. Infiltrate yeah. his phone, get a few answers. I thought it was very interesting. Subtly we'll now, subtly. Don't yeah. <laughs> Great player, though. Um, so that's uh, enough URC for the moment. Will we move on to a couple of questions? Yeah, we've uh, a couple of fan questions, I believe. Yeah. Now, don't worry, it was just the three of them sent in questions. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> that's three, three more than I was expecting. I'm already joking. Honestly. I'm already joking. No, <laughs> two of them were from you. Right? <laughs> don't <Yeah>. anyway. <laughs> well, they're questions from us and the fans. Um, so, first up is you announced your retirement last year, and now you're the head coach of Rainy Old Boys. And was coaching always the plan for you? Is that the dream? After rugby? Uh, well, the first dream was to be a professional rugby player. I mean, that's honestly the, the thing that, you know, I love doing from when I was a kid. So, um, you know, I was lucky enough after what happened to be able to experience it and, and live through it. And yeah, I mean, I retired at 32 now, I retired at 31. So some people might think it's 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 an early age, but I mean, I love coaching as well. I really do. And I love sort of interaction with with people and trying to get the best out of people. And it is difficult because you're 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 in control but not in control because when it comes to game day you you really can't do very very much so no i really enjoy it and love it and just uh, the developing thing is something that really interests me and just sort of get enthusiasm uh, within the game and, and getting people to play it i think is you know the most important thing because it's a it's a wonderful game that has given us you know us three yeah. uh, more good memories than not so uh, hopefully that can you can replicate that for someone else. Yeah, and did COVID kind of, was that a catalyst for you retiring or? Yeah, uh, yeah so we were living, myself and my wife were living uh, in Treviso, which was about sort of three hours from where the epicenter of it came in, in Europe. So it was in a place called Bergamo. So mm. it was a pretty scary time to be living in, everything closed, mm. police drones uh, above your house. If you went further than 200 oh meters, they, yeah, they'd Jeez. call you up, you know, and that sort of thing. They were pretty strict about it. Um, wow. So it was definitely a scary time. And we just started having a, a family and everything. So I think being close to family after, you know, a near 10 year period away, I just I think we felt it was the uh, correct time to come home. Yeah, because as you said, you're, you're now at half 31 is what you retired which we considered yep. that you'd still have a couple more years left. Mm-hmm. Is there still that itch that you might get back playing? Every day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but as a, no, my decision is 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 firmly made. And uh, listen, I'm sort of, after everything that sort of happened, I'm I'm at peace with, with everything and uh, with the goggles, you know, it, it was challenging, very, very challenging, but I can, uh, I can be happy with sort of a half vision to get to international. Rugby. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I think you have the next question. I, I do. do. Uh, so you first moved obviously to coach. Mm-hmm. Um, how difficult was that move, especially since you didn't speak Italian? Very difficult. Use your hands. <laughs> the <laughs> the gestures, of, just the try gestures. and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to move quicker and come here and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it was sort of a baptism, baptism of fire because, uh, what was it? I, uh, you were doing my coaching initially, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I'd retired. So I'd uh, sort of retired twice. My fir- first retirement. <laughs> you uh, love so retirement. I, you're like, I love, I love that. retirement. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe a third time. <laughs> but, um, what age are you when you first went down there? 21. 21 and you yeah. retired at 21? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, Obviously, you weren't a good coach to start off. Like. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now I moved over and um, I was teaching rugby in, in the club that I was with and also uh, the school. And yeah, trying to coach teenagers or Italian teenagers rugby uh, when you don't speak Italian is uh, is a difficult thing. So you, you learn it pretty quickly yeah. or else you, you you don't do anything. So And did they have patience for you or were they like, oh, Jesus, absolutely this not. Irish they, fella now? Oh no, they slagged me to high heaven. So, oh. But that's good. That's how you, you learn yeah. and you put yourself in awkward situations and that, that was the, the, the best way of learning. And, you know, even simple things like ringing up Vodafone to get Wi-Fi, <laughs> try and do that when you don't speak the language. So <laughs> How did you even get the job without speaking Italian? Uh, Irish contacts here, okay. so uh, oh, typically Irish, yeah, you exactly. know, not watching Ireland, them, yeah. Irish people are all over the world, and they just happened. There was a guy over there who was in the north eastern region of of Italy looking for a coach. So, I just always had a fascination with Italy, and weather's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> uh, wine, wine is even better, and. Uh, <laughs> 
why not why not go over and uh see what you can do so and, and how did sorry uh, it's obviously a question for you but yeah. like it's how did you get back into playing rugby then like yeah so uh like had the itch just i think when you retire at any stage mm-hmm. no matter where you're 20 or 40 or 50 whatever it's always a really hard thing and i just felt at 21 you know it's so much more to give and like i really did have this dream to play without being too cheesy or anything like i just wanted to play international rugby is all i wanted to do and um, for Ireland it was still well like, yeah, yeah I mean I grew up in, in, in Ireland represented under 20s and all that sort of stuff so that was obviously my home union mm. and, um, yeah just I don't know had a, had a sort of a, a good cry with my brother one, when, one day when he was visiting me and sort of found out that there were these sort of rugby protective goggles and yeah. got them after or got them in 2014 so that was three years after I retired and just started playing junior uh, rugby with the uh, the team that I was coaching so mm. be J honestly J4 J5 level it was really quite something to see <laughs> um, and yeah just sort of progressed up up the ladder through through that way um, and yeah just arrived at Benetton and, and Italy so that was yeah well congratulations on well, your dream yeah, coming true I know it wasn't incredible. for your with a, with a different but... yeah the dream the dream was was a bit different no different. but it's like never say it as cheesy because like as athletes if we didn't have goals and dreams then mm-hmm. we wouldn't aspire to anything mm-hmm. so um huge congratulations Thank you know because you. Yeah. you know so many maybe would have taken a back step or, or well, let all these stumbling blocks that you would have maybe yeah. faced you know well, I think you know we all know we all go through ups and downs mm-hmm. in you know not just <laughs> sporting life and life in general and that was just obviously the the, the 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 hand that I was given and yeah. you're just you're fortunate enough to have the other one so why not try and make the the most of it in a sort of safe manner and that's why I decided to to use the goggles and yeah, yeah. there was there was difficulties but you just had to work your way through it yeah no it's amazing like some players can't pass off their left hand so (laughs) kick off you know a foot so I just love your energy I just want to keep you here uh, uh, all the time it's a positive I thought you were going to slag me I will give me time but like just stop being so nice and energetic right and just get (laughs) for for anyone that doesn't know I've been living under a rock you obviously had an accident playing a rugby game and someone stood stood in you and you uh, lost your eyesight in your left eye yeah um which I just think it's amazing how positive you are and that you just came back and you started playing to the top level of international rugby as well. You didn't just start playing with your club. So um, that kind of leads me on to the goggles, which you mentioned earlier. You kind of pioneered that for everyone. And I have a cousin back home. Um, his name's Ian Brown. He, he listens to the podcast and he has issues with his eyes as well. He's had surgeries and he was told he wasn't allowed to play. But then he saw people like you wearing the goggles and he went away and got the goggles. Now he's back playing club rugby with Brilliant. Shannon. And he's just like, it's incredible yeah, to see. And without people like you, paving the way that would have never happened like so you must be so proud of it well that's yeah that's probably the the, the 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 most important thing out of all of it is that you have two and a half thousand people worldwide that are registered to to use them so yeah. that's uh you know that's fantastic that also gives you energy when i was playing that would you know give me uh an extra reason to sort of keep going because there, there were days where you know it would be difficult to see and they'd be you know maybe it might have been pulled off for a split second and things like that yeah. so you know it was difficult but if you got a message from someone saying oh i my you know my cousin or whatever uses yeah. them you know like you know what energy does that give you it's it's fantastic so they're not for everyone Um, you know some people uh, would never obviously need them but for people that are in need uh, just to be able to experience we, we all talk about inclusion uh, and, and togetherness and all that sort of stuff plan you were talking about absolutely you know why not if someone is visually impaired who previously wasn't allowed to play with goggles a uh, certain type of goggles why can't they partake in in rugby and, yeah. and people get exposed to it that's um, what i love about sport like I do love this about sport is that we come together on a common goal, but you could talk about, you know, inclusion and, you know, we fight through adversity or we try to get over stumbling blocks to make sure it is for everybody. Mm. And uh, no, it's just brilliant. Yeah, and so. it, it's funny what comes from that. Like I've started working with visually impaired rugby, both in, in England and Ireland here, and we're trying to get it in Italy. So it's amazing what you, the mixed ability rugby as well, you know, dying in Sunday as well. Yeah. And all that is amazing what, yeah. you know, from an accident things can can come about. And it's great to be involved in those sort of initiatives as well. Well, that's the thing, when it happened to you, you were probably like just so upset. You thought your dream was probably taken mm-hmm. from you. You obviously flipped that around and now you've made such an impact not just in rugby but in the world of sport like you know yeah. you've shown that you can still play a contact sport within a visual impairment and like it's just opens up to everyone that might think it's all over so you should be very proud of yourself well i appreciate it but i mean like yeah pe- people have some limitations and you know might be the same might be different but you know i think everyone's out to prove people wrong uh, and, and and that sort of gives everyone you know the bit between the teeth as well to yeah. to tog out each week and no it's 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 you're always sort of proving people 
Yeah. Wrong. Uh, and do you mind me asking you a rugby nerd question? You obviously played out half, so massive flankers will be trying to open you up. Yeah. Can you? Would you be able to see them out no. your left side? No. So you just had to. Oh, how did you? How did you play like that? That's mad. Just get nine to kick the ball. Was, yeah. <laughs> the scrum half to kick the ball. It was easy. <laughs> so I didn't have to do anything. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm no, sure no. you're. Yeah, one of your no. centres uh, be having well, your like, match. Imagine like you played Six Nations. You could have Courtney Laws trying to break your ribs, like, and you yeah, can't see him coming. Uh, sort of defensive scenarios were a bit tricky as well. If you had all your defenders inside me here, I. So I mean, I had to tweak certain things, uh, passing how to catch and. I'm left footed, so sometimes I didn't see the ball if I kicked it, so I had to change my body angle. So it was a, work, a constant work in, work in progress. And I think you know, that I didn't master it, which is probably going to be something that will really irritate me. But um, <laughs> I think you did. Man. I think, well, yeah. I think you're being uh, a bit harsh. No, well, <laughs> the, the, there's, there's some aspects that were, you know, frustrating yeah, that, you know, even with the goggles, it actually yeah. I actually saw less than what I would do normally because just of the padding. So you'd have sort of 10 degrees less. So, um, but it was just, you know, you just have to constantly uh, work hard at it. And th the interesting thing was, is that you learn something after every mm. game. It actually was incredible. So apart from the fact of just playing rugby for the sake of playing rugby and learning from it, you picked up something every time with the goggles, whether it was a, a reflection of the light on a, a floodlight might be different in some stadium to another one playing yeah. in daylight, in the evening, rain, you know all that sort of stuff so it, uh, was it, the rain it, a pain because uh, you know was, obviously you wear glasses yeah, so tricky, while yeah. like oh yeah it was tricky yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, you're some man. Um, when you look back at your career from ucd to leinster and then to italy what is your proudest moment um proudest personal moment would have to be first cap for italy um so obviously yeah i am irish was you know came through the mm -hmm. underage ranks and, and and all that but italy uh was there whenever i needed them needed someone the most in terms of signing up uh, to the goggles trial so that yes. it was it was um not every union uh, signed up to it and italy was the first one to do that which enabled me and other kids to to use the goggles and play so uh putting on pulling on the blue jersey um of the azuri of the azuri bravissima <laughs> mm -hmm. um against fiji was just like i can't describe it and like just winning which uh, was obviously yeah, a hard thing to do with true. italy yeah. uh w w you know just to win that first game or whatever that was just hugely proud and to i think that the, the moment uh was just like even singing the national anthem and just have my whole family just with tears in their eyes in front of you, you just see them in the yeah. stand and they're just crying right. and you're just like wow okay it obviously means so much to people so it's a great anthem definitely so. isn't it it's so passionate yeah, it's and can we tell us this now um, no no holds barred do you yeah. have to sing a first cap song for italy so italy uh you shave your head stop the lights they Did give you, do you that? A they i give can't you, imagine that they give you a different sort of haircut so you could have a mohawk or you could have one half completely shaved and and your look was my look was geez what was it i think it was just sort of one line across the top so no way <laughs> through the completely bald it would just like yeah just here and then leave two bits you're joking so, yeah, yeah, i yeah. think you agreed to do that before you leave the show today <laughs> <That is> hilarious <laughs> we're staying on the topic of italy we kind of spoke about it earlier their great win against um wales in the principality stadium do you think they can realistically build on that within the next couple of campaigns or are we gonna have to wait for the italy 20s to come through who did really well this year yeah uh i think if you saw the the average age i think of the squad initially was 23 24 and that last game that they played was 25 or so so it's it's a young squad anyway that they are fast tracking the these young guys and um, they've they're sort of paving the way but you have to make sure that everything beneath that is is correct and we see how good mm -hmm. the irish system yeah. is amongst the academies i mean uh, and that's the the building block i mean that can't stop if that stops then uh Italy will have to re restart again, and, and and people mightn't be so patient. So they have to. They have and do to, they have that set up there, as similar to here the schools, very, the provinces? It's, it's very different. So there's okay. no sport in school. Would you believe it's sort wow. of similar to France in that everything is done within the clubs. Okay. Uh, so even whenever I sort of coached uh, rugby, you would get a 45 minute to an hour block with the kids, and that would have been their PE for the week. And that wow. was in school, so which is so surprising when you think of Italy as a whole in terms of a sporting nation. Yeah, they're uh, pretty big. Very, very big. So that that's quite a shock, uh, and it's also a massive country. I mean, you've seventy or seventy million people. Right. Uh, I know rugby is mainly from Rome up north, but uh, the, the academies are quite spread. Yeah, the women's play predominantly up north. They were telling us about one club. 
um, yeah. a lot of their players come from. So there's Val Sugana, yeah. Padova, I know, um, Monza in, in Milan uh, was is, is, even though actually none of the women representing Monza at the moment yeah. uh, uh, for the game against France. Uh, but they're sort of two two big clubs. Big but generally, clubs. North, yeah, from Rome north uh, is where rugby is uh, more uh, prominent. But only the, you know, I mean, you have Benetton and Zebra, the two biggest teams in Italy, and there's no academy underneath them. So we would, you talk about whenever uh, Leinster Internationals go away and you have this conveyor belt of people, you know, coming under and yeah. being able to do training sessions. Like I remember my first year with Benetton, we would have had 20 to 25 players to do a session. Mm. Um, so that's only starting to, to happen when that, I yeah. was leaving. Uh, I was coaching in the Treviso Academy uh, and that was, that only just started. They just know? started the academy when you were leaving? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So, um, you know, people can see results and go, yeah, Italy is terrible, but if the foundations aren't there, so it's only now that it's starting to really sort of develop and that's why these young players are are coming through. Yeah, they came fourth in the uh, Six Nations yeah. in their 20s and they beat England yeah. and they beat Wales and Scotland, I believe. Yeah. Which is massive. Three massed, wins is big, yeah. Which three is so wins big, is, yeah. is, is very big. Uh, and like they've been winning consistently against Scotland and, and Wales. I mean, that England result was the first time. Um, they gave the Irish trouble, but you know what? Their discipline was terrible that night. I think they had two yellow cards, if memory serves me Discipline right. is an issue. Uh, yeah, with a very passionate when it, nation. <laughs> whenever, whenever, yeah, whenever you have, you know, your review meetings on Monday morning, you can be guaranteed the same word uh, will be repeated and, and that's it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it, 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 it's frustrating because you think, well, Italian football team, even though they didn't qualify, but generally you think defensive orientated and they're so yeah. disciplined. How can that not be transferred to... Uh, to a rookie different person, I assume you just have to have a different personality, really, with rugby. Don't probably, yeah. probably, and I suppose it was a bit more physical. You're a bit more, yeah, yeah. But with all these guys coming in from that Italian 20s team with this young senior team, mm. uh, felt like Capuzzo, how'd you pronounce Cap it? Capuzzo, Capuzzo. Yeah, yeah. guys like that, Gabrisi. Um, like surely in the next couple of years, Italy are going to be fighting for maybe third, fourth place in the senior six nations, yeah. They need to get back to at least sort of t targeting two wins, um, and you just don't want it to be seven. What is it? Seven years since the last, uh, yeah, the last, yeah, twenty fifteen. Yeah, yeah, which it, it is crazy. Thirty five games, I think. It yeah, and it's yeah. it's and it's a horrible place to be. You 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 feel about that small, and um, you know you you do feel it as as a player. But you know, losing can become a habit. Winning can become a habit. That victory at the end there I, will do absolute wonders. I think just particularly because it was the last game away from home, that just generates momentum and a, and a good feel. Yeah. Uh, because you, you do, whenever you go into a camp that has lost 20 uh, in a row, you, mm. you feel you feel bogged down, you feel a bit of that doom and gloom, and it's only up to you as the group to try and, to try and change that. I was thinking that today, I was chatting with a couple of the lads, and we're thinking, in the dressing room before an Italian game, for the last 36 games before they beat Wales, mm -hmm. how do you get up for a game? What's the talk in the dressing room? Because surely you can't be, all right, let's just go out and win this every time, because you hadn't, hadn't won in 36 game so yeah. what was the dressing room like when you're in there yeah well you, you don't necessarily I suppose think oh we're going to win this you think of little uh, performances yeah exactly so you'd have little little goals and I think even Kieran Crowley spoke of that maybe before the Wales game mm. you, you you try and work on your discipline so everyone talks about now um, you know 10 penalties or less if you go above that then you're going to be in difficulty so try and focus on that you know that aspect for for this game and try and focus on 90 percent in your scrum line out whatever it may be i think it's, it's more performance goals if you can get those then the result sort of takes care of itself and yeah. um, but certainly when you were playing against maybe england away you knew that of course you maybe knew in the back of your mind that it was going to be a, 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 a yeah. it was a particularly it was going to be a more difficult game than uh, than maybe you know scotland away or at home or, or something like that but i mean you went into every game believing that you you could win because otherwise what's the point in in showing up that's what i think it must be so hard mentally because you're so passionate the italians as well to just every day just go out go out yeah. so you saw the emotion when they actually beat wales and they were all crying as if they won the world cup yeah. i think everyone in the world is only crying i swear them. and then even i was i was at the game against ireland and mm -hmm. the fact of um the getting down to 13 and yeah. the mad rule about the front row, uh, which everyone's like, what the hell happened here? Yeah. You're just like, do you know what? These guys can't actually catch a break yeah. here. They yeah. just can't catch a break. Yeah, but they, they kept going. Yeah, and, they did. And, and I think, you they know, were a, straight, lot of, and, and a lot of people were, were won over by Italy's sort of w unwillingness to, to give up. And, 
you know, the, Michele Lamaro, who's who is the captain. I mean, he's twenty three, and you know, so I know young. Driscoll got the Irish captaincy around the same mm. age, but it's a huge responsibility uh, for him. But he's able to 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 have this now, you know, and 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 the team has been built around him. Mm. The team has been built around Garbisi, as you're saying, uh, and I I really hope from you know probably a biased point of view, but this will this will develop, this will generate because you said the twenties are winning. Uh, that they need to make that consistent against some of the bigger teams and the under 18s are are winning you know they've beaten Ireland they've beaten England they've beaten mm. Scotland the last couple of years so there's absolutely no reason trying to transition these guys from that uh, up until I think you're stuff. right I think like obviously on the women's fifth side we've seen it when you don't have because obviously the infancy of it if you don't have a structure from grassroots up to feed those players in you're nearly always going to start behind at the, such oh, yeah. a high level Do you know when what you're competing at say for the Irish underage, like we would have worked with Kieran Hallett, who works with the Leinster under twenties, and mm-hmm. to see, and he would have had uh, Hawkshaw and all those guys, and now they've gone into senior. So just to expose them and, and bring them up through the ranks gradually, I think if they can get there. Yeah, and it's it's a balancing act as well because yeah. if you, if you throw someone in too early and they're not necessarily ready, you you know can you lose. can risk you can risk, yeah. but it's almost it's almost actually sort of the Italy senior team is similar to the, the women's team almost in 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 their cycle and their yeah. their their thinking of going for um you know younger players less caps but you know th- this is who we're investing in and yeah. hopefully in the next few years then it'll sort yeah, of give them that time to do exactly yeah. i'm looking forward to it anyway as am i um i suppose here there's been a lot of talk about say players who aren't um you know they're not Irish. They've they've been here and have a right to play for Ireland. Um, d- did you feel any resistance from the Italians when you were it became eligible to play for them? No, uh, and I can understand people's some people's frustration about it. Um, but no, I never had anything because when I went over there, uh, so in Ireland, I was sort of maybe in the, in the rugby community anyway, seen as oh the poor guy that you know burst his <laughs> eyeball and had to retire. In Italy, I was known as Ian McKinley, the rugby player with the goggles, which is lovely and, for you. Which was lovely. Mm. You sort of created. Um, an image of yourself that uh, was positive and you know nobody felt sorry for you or anything like that so yeah I can understand when you uh, hear Ian McKinley it's not uh, an Italian name but you know my perspective has definitely changed and you know I, I I want Italy to do well and I'm passionate about Italy and I look forward to getting back out over there and mm. and you know helping Italy uh, whenever the, the, that time is right and um, so that's the plan Back and oh, I won't. Italy. I won't disclose anything. But we I got mean, an exclusive. Yes, we have here. Good job. No exclusive. But I mean, I, I just think that, that there's so much potential there that we've all seen. That they have really good players, but if you don't have a structure, it's 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 yeah. difficult to get that. And we're going back to the sort of the same the same thing. But no, I never got any um, bad yeah. no or bad press. Or you might get an article from someone saying something, but uh, at the end of the day, Italy invested in me. I was invested in Italy and would hope to be in in the future. And and as I said, I. Couldn't have been more proud putting on that jersey, even though, yeah, most of the time you you, you lost the games, but I'm so proud to represent the country and play for mm-hmm. play with the guys that yeah. I did. But on the flip side of that, I remember uh, when you first played for Italy, I was watching it back in Ireland, back in Limerick where I was, and I was so proud just that an Irish lad was playing for Italy at 10. I just thought it was really cool. So I think everyone in Ireland was so proud of you going over there and getting to the top of it as well. But then I was thinking, if Ireland are playing Italy, are you shouting for Italy or are you shouting for Ireland? <laughs> Oh, in, what sp- in, what, in, what, in what sport now? Yeah. Uh, in, in rugby. <laughs> so, who... so in the Six Nations campaign there when Italy came over. Oh, am I going to shoot myself in the foot? <laughs> I put no, you on the spot. I, I mean, I still have my mates that play for Italy and no, I'd be cheering for Italy. Yeah. Would you? Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm, I'm invested in them and I want to see them do well. I don't think Ireland need my help anyway they seem to be doing fine so um i uh no i, I, I like that I you took a stance in it fair play yeah yeah you. no I, I would yeah i would definitely yeah. if, in studio or if i'm at the game yeah i'd be yeah uh, I'd, be swe- I'd be swearing when I ireland score hard, and, you know what to really you know be my usual you know slag yourself because you're just so good you know it's lovely because my philosophy on whether you're uh you know italian born you know you you kind of fall into a bubble and you fall into a family and and a team and you you grow into that team do you know so whether you're Italian by birth that's you were meant to that's mm-hmm. your journey in life you mm-hmm. obviously seem to have gotten a rebirth you know with new identity you got to live out your dream mm-hmm. and to get that opportunity and um well, we it, thank the Italians for minding Ian McKinley oh, yeah. <laughs> but I think we look at some of the Irish examples and what 
you know, probably Bundiaki is probably the most obvious, yeah. uh, even though you've got James Lowe and all that sort of stuff. who's going back home. Yeah. Exactly. But think of the positive impact that those guys have had on Irish rugby is massive. Yeah. You know, and Bundiaki has been, you know, he's a role model for a lot of people uh, down in Connacht. So, uh, you know, it it has its, its massive, massive... Uh, highs and, yeah but and he would have had a rebirth aspects. you know coming yeah, yeah. to Ireland and playing McConnacht and then obviously then the opportunity was to play for Ireland but you know I think he was if memory serves me right to you know he needed that time here to to kick start his career and mm-hmm. as a player and I think yes anyone who impacts Ireland positively and and brings on other players and and can impact them because you know we've all performed in high performance there's no hiding place like if someone does not fit in or they're not pulling their weight they're not going to survive there mm-hmm. like that's the end of the story you're mm-hmm. not you're like this jersey means too much for us you know, for you to be half ass and, and and someone else on the outside of the bubble not getting an opportunity. And, and you can spot that from a mile Absolutely. away. Absolutely. You know, so if you have those guys, CJ, uh, James Lowe and, and Bundiaki, given their yeah. their best for the cause, then nobody can 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 argue with that. Mm. And rules are made by other people and players are only following the rules. Exactly, yeah. That's what I was just about to say. Took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Great <laughs> mind and all that. <laughs> uh, so a little bit more lighthearted for the last question for you. So you obviously lived in glorious Italy for a few years. You mentioned the wine, you mentioned the coffee, um, but you're based in Belfast now, which is a little bit different. Do you think you're missing Italy or are you happy where you are in Belfast? Yeah, I'm, I'm based 30 minutes north of Belfast, so it's even sort of further away. So we're in more the middle rain. of... Say again? More rain. More rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The grey days are, are tough. Uh, do I miss Italy? Yeah, of course I do. Um, it's uh, You wouldn't die of a heart attack uh, living <laughs> in Italy, honestly. It's a very relaxed uh, lifestyle. If you want to get things done, I can see it being a very frustrating place to live because... Yeah. You have your siestas in the middle, and then that siesta might of three hours might go on a little bit more. And <laughs> oh, sure, we'll open the shop at eleven. It's okay. <laughs> there's no, there's never any panic. So it's it's a completely different way of life to over here. And um, you know, we we had a wonderful time there, and I really do still you know call it my home. I'm just lucky to have two homes. You know, whether yeah. it's Ireland and uh, or Italy, I'm lucky to have that. So yeah, it's uh, it's it is a beautiful place to. To live. So you were there for a decade, was it? Near that, yeah, near enough, yeah. Wow, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, and it's kind of maybe when your son grows, you have a son, right? Isn't it? Son, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. When he grows up, you might uh, go back maybe there. Maybe could the old Duolingo. I yeah, know, might might help him. I don't know. Will he be a future rugby star in his dad's footsteps? I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I played Gaelic football as well growing up nice. uh, with Kilmacud. Future club. Kilmacud, oh Kilmacud, Jesus, so, right, yeah. that's it. The slagging is starting. Now. Yeah, it is. No, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> wrong answer. <laughs> we, James, we had a very good team. Very, very, very good team. So. So I was lucky, lucky to be involved with yeah. them. So um, I don't know. I mean, he's certainly got the frame for it at the moment. He's a big, big boy. Mummy's feeding him well. So nice. I, know, I think he's uh, doing a good job. Happy Mother's Day to your to your wife you. on her yeah. first our firstborn. So. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing how you progress in your career. I have a little inkling now. Coaching might bring you back to Italy, and you'll be sitting there having a coffee Who and knows? a bit of wine. But we'll, we'll see. Um, thanks so much for those questions. Great answers and great insight. But we we'll move back onto the URC. Uh, we have another. Uh, we just spoke about you being in Belfast. Also, we're playing on the weekend. They narrowly lost twenty three twenty away to Stormers, and there was a bit of controversy at the end. I presume when you watched that game, you did. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, the the Italian referee given uh, a no try at the end. Yeah. So it's fairly uh, debatable issue, but I think they got that completely yeah. wrong. We have and a clip here, but actually, we have another look at it. Yeah, uh, here we are now. Yeah, I don't know if uh, the referee was influenced by the TMO, um, whether he should have maybe stood his ground. But... Right on ball. Separation, okay, captain. We got the loose of the ball, so it's a, it's a knock on sure. scrum there. The, 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 there's no clear separation, yeah. The TMO is okay, it's sure. scrum there. Scrum. Sure. So, so I think he was saying it wasn't a deliberate knock on. I, like I sure. would have thought, to me, in my opinion, looking at that, and I've looked at it a couple of times, I would have said a stormer's not gone. To be honest, that's I what I thought initially. Absolutely issue, raging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being ulstered, you know. Now, in saying that, you can't go fourteen nil down, and they were always chasing the game. It shouldn't mm-hmm. have come down to that last score. You shouldn't have to come down to a referee. Uh, but I'd be pretty aggrieved now if I was, yeah, the replacement loose head who scored there. Um, yeah. Yeah. What did you think of it, Ian? A bad call. Yeah. 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 I, I, I don't know how you can give a, a scrum to the. I can understand this maybe if it wasn't a try, but it still should have been Ulster ball because if the ball is knocked out of his hand, uh, it's, 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 it's a knock on. Yeah, yeah it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a knock on, but yeah. I suppose if, it, if it's if it's knocked backwards, or sorry, if it's knocked on by the yeah. Stormers, and yet the Ulster player scores it with his 
tummy or his belly, yeah. it's still a try. A try, yeah. yeah. So first instinct is should have been a try. If at least there was doubt about the try, Dang it should have been a scrum too. for yeah. for Ulster. So yeah, I think they got it completely wrong. Yeah, I feel quite aggrieved. You're an Ulster man, yeah. but Stormers are playing well. They scored 16 tries in the last two games going into that game against Ulster. Um, the, the Ulster guys did okay. They had Luke Marshall back after a year out. I actually, when the commentator said his name, I was like, Luke Marshall, he's back playing rugby. Where was he? Yeah, he's a great player. So hopefully he um, got through it unscathed. Alan O'Connor made his 150th appearance for Ulster. Uh, Stahl worked up there. Um, I'm, I'm unfortunate for him not getting into an Irish squad. Like people like him and Ross Baloney, who are just like you know, plugging away every week, playing really good rugby, but they just don't get into Irish squads. Uh, Marty Moore had a great game. Um, he might get to the trip in New Zealand this summer, do you think? Uh, yeah, well, he's been around the block, it seems like, for, for years, Marty. I mean, I remember when I was in Leinster and he was sort of breaking through and everyone was talking about this new kid on the block. So um, I think he, I think the big thing for him is just finding form and just consistency of games. I think that's been the, the, the biggest thing, particularly when he went away to, to Wasps, I think it was. So, yeah. I mean, he, he could be. I mean, he's he's a very talented player. He, he's very good in the scrum. And yeah, um, there's no reason why he, he couldn't be there for selection. I think, yeah, consistency in his performance is probably now till the end of the season and really probably go a long way. But um, I think Ulster will be upset now with the breakdown. I think the Stormers lived off that. They pressurised. They they like live off turnovers and they really made it difficult for, for Ulster on the day. They, uh, did, they got yeah. a lot of turnovers. They got mm. a lot of kind of fast break uh rugby and they caused them kind of trouble all day so they did but the, the South African teams are just playing so well I know we mentioned it Very last well. week like but they're obviously targeting these home games and they're winning their home games, which is amazing. Like we've Playing some nice stuff. Playing some really good stuff. Two very, two, uh, very early tries, two of them, um, which were straight up the middle, serious pace. They looked like the Ulster lads had played like 60, 70 minutes and they had only two minutes into the game and they were falling all over the place. So Well, I think the heat, it went from like 26 degrees to 22. So I'm not sure going from uh, rainy, windy, grey uh, Ulster shores now to, yeah. to the... Lovely South African sun. Now. Maybe the, maybe these Irish provinces have to start prepping a bit better for going. Oh out yeah, South a bit Africa. of a climate. It's, yeah, seems like they're out in their feet, like, and they're they're not playing too well over there. What do you think of it? Ian? Uh, well, yeah, it's it's tough as well. I suppose the international lads, you know, straight away, I know that there might necessarily be a lot of them, but there's a few that go straight from Six Nations onto a plane to South Africa. I mean, it it takes a fair amount out of you, but yeah, you can see the South African teams are. Finding form, they're so physical. So, yeah. It's just it's you, you watch the yeah the breakdown areas you said mm. their defense and I think Ulster could have really won that game and yeah as you said give them fourteen points you know they to come back from that is you know shows good character from them but I think the the Stormers seem to be the most dangerous out of all of the yes, they are very all, all of the teams even though Sharks have maybe more superstar names in their team but they their defense is just unbelievable and their phys physicality is, is something else so it just brings a different dimension to the whole competition because previously you would have played against you know southern kings or uh, the cheetahs and maybe you didn't necessarily get the best south african teams these are now yeah. the best south african teams and you can see what it what it what is like to come up against them yeah they're forces to be reckoned with because lions even smashed the ospreys 45 15. Mm. um some great tries in that i think um, band of Mervis tries actually in our, our try of the weeks will We'll get that one in a bit. But some other results. Um, Scarlets finally got a win. They beat Zebra away, 41-24. Good um, first half there, but finally the Welshies are up and running. Yeah, I didn't actually catch that one. Did you watch it? Uh, watch bits of it. Um, yeah, obviously they've had a tough season. Um, so, and I think one to watch is uh, Tua Lupa too, if I have a right. Carwin Tupelo too, yeah. He's only 20 years old. Um, six six two. Uh, 20 stone and he's son of a Tongan international so I think he's the next big Welsh thing so mm -hmm. I think it's uh, yeah some positivity for the Welsh provinces which haven't had an easy season exactly yet. they needed it but uh, commiserations for Zebra what's what's going on over there with them yeah, one of my old old clubs just for a few games yeah uh, three uh, caps for Zebra I think do you I, yeah yeah. Done your research. Did my research. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> three caps no brownie win. points no, no, for you no wins <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah it, Zebra is a really it's it's different to Benetton um, in terms of sort of how it's run, um, but they they've been really poor this year. Uh, I think yeah. it's been the most the worst performance, not only on the table but their games and their results in you know many years. Um, and Scarlets have been struggling, and I know they maybe have a few new coaching staff in there, so they're maybe getting used to different ways of of doing things. But I mean to 
to to ship that amount of points at home uh, against Scarlets is is, yeah. is not good and it's just not good for the competition and and they're really struggling. I think they've got one point the whole season. It's oh. Just really, yeah, it's it's that's that's not that, that's not good, not yeah. good. And there's a lot of players that are leaving, um, that have announced that they're leaving. Uh, so I don't know exactly what's going on. Is it in-house stuff? Do you think? Uh, well, there's a few of them that are leaving are, are maybe sort of older guys that have been okay. there a long time. But you talk about, um, you know, how do you get yourself up for Italian games if you're not winning? Well, mm. imagine if you're playing for Zebre and it's week after week after week after week, year after year after year. Yeah. So there's going to have to be a culture sh- shift, a massive culture shift there. Benetton did it a few years ago. And they're going to have to do something because otherwise they're going to continuously yeah. finish uh, last. And, and I don't say that lightly. I uh, know a lot of guys that, that player there and work their socks off, but the, um, to lose that game as much as they did uh, is is not good. Not and is there a, much help from the Italian rugby union for the clubs? You know, here the IRFU take a lot of care of each province to make sure mm-hmm. players are going to the right places. That there's funding, or is Zebra kind of just left to do their own thing, or Benetton left to do their own thing? Yeah, it could be. A, it probably could be managed uh, a lot better, um, definitely. But I think just with with, with Zebra, the, there's no, there's been no um, sort of history with them. Um, there are three sort of main Parma teams that are in the area, but as a, as a collective, Zebra is very young. It's sort of similar to maybe some of the Welsh regions, but it just hasn't ignited. And I know because I lived in Parma as well for a few years and you would struggle to get people to the game. And it's just trying to create that buzz and that culture of what is Zebra rugby. So uh, that, that's a, that's an issue that goes deeper than just the results on, on the pitch. Uh, because again, they have some players quality players coming through but again if, if you just don't have that structure it's impossible for these young guys to to flourish so yeah. hopefully they you know can can get their um their squad sorted for next season um but if, if they don't it's going to be a really really tough season yeah. next year you'd um, hope some of those italian 20s guys are playing for zebra and they'll actually bring it up from the grassroots up you, you would hope so you yeah. would hope so yeah because they all can't play for benetton so <laughs> well the, 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 that's the imbalance is that you have what on average 13 14 players in the match day squad for for the games uh, and you'd have two or three at, at zebra so it's, it's is that it's much an, of an imbalance yeah 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 wow and that's uh, tough then yeah you know. which 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 is you know that sh- that shows <laughs> which way it, it's going which is not good yeah. so italian yeah. rugby probably need to get involved there and start moving guys around yeah again it's difficult then when you've got the two teams i know yeah. scotland have the two as well but i think they have the luxury of of pushing guys out a bit more uh, whereas for italy you wouldn't have that that yeah. many you've got garbizzi away you've got varney who plays for gloucester and these sort of things but you could count them on one hand how many is away so i think italy are trying to encourage the ones that are showing early promise to go abroad and then that opens up space maybe for uh you know, Zebre or Benetton to, yeah. to get in a few more players, yeah. Italian players. Exactly. We're sure Cap, I'm going to say it wrong again, Capruso just signed for Toulouse. Yeah. Exactly like that. Yeah. Um, so a couple of other results just to rattle them off. Cardiff beat Glasgow narrowly, 32-28. Bulls, again, another South African team, smashed the Dragons, 55-20. And Edinburgh won away to the Sharks, uh, 21-5. Fair play to Edinburgh, getting away win there. Um, so next up, we're going to go on to try the week, a bit of crack. Um, first up is Rhino Smith's diving effort for Benetton against Munster. This was an incredible try. I think they had advantage at the time. Because um, it seemed a bit nuts. You're like, don't kick it, don't kick it. The winger as well. Yeah, two, unreal finish. Uh, yeah, Tuva, the 14, is not known for his kicking. But that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. I was like, what is he doing? Yeah, oh, that's a question crazy rule, um, finish. finish as well. But. Our second try here is from Edville van der Merwe with his uh, his effort against Ospreys. Um, what a turn of pace and a little... Uh, a little goose step down the little wing. Little goose yeah. step. I've always like dreamed of doing that and fall, yeah. falling over. It's seriously impressive, isn't it? Here we go. Yeah, gone. You can't buy speed. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, incredible. And their third one is uh, Tierna Halloran try from Jack Carty's incredible looping pass. I'd say he threw it about 20, 25 metres. Um, and they had a red card at that time. So great vision by Jack Carty. So what do you think? Those three tries, which one would you give number one spot? Am I going to be biased? <laughs> <laughs> the better it has to be Rhino Smith. Yeah, just yeah. to be biased. The context of it, I think, I, just the, the wrong foot as well. And yeah, the finish and, I, yeah, it's just... I, you're trying to picture like trying to judge like 
how the ball is going to bounce and you know down in Musgrave there it's synthetic as well isn't it you it know is. so you just don't know which way it's going to go so yeah I'll be biased I agree Rhino Smith's finish well I'm under pressure now because the two of you so we'll go with Rhino Smith then. Uh, well done, congratulations right. yeah <laughs> um, now it's jukebox of the week so let's have a look at who made the cut Ruin Nell is a hard hitter I played against him a couple of times oh. for the South African Sevens he just always goes like that do you know what, Mike Larry looked like he had more time there and he did not see him. Mm, look, he wasn't high tackle. Um, so next one up is Connor Oliver's tackle, friend of the show. He was on recently. Um, he gets a bit of help from Jared Butler there and it's a great smash. He's playing really good rugby, uh, Connor Oliver. Very strong. He was actually stand out, I think, against the Stormers when he came off the bench as well. And, and he's uh, talking right. Scott Penny there as well. Like That's not a light guy that he's hitting back. And last but not least, we have Scott Penny's tackle on Paul Boyle. He's getting the one back, Scott Penny. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he kept that in his back pocket. He is. He's not a great back rower, um, Scott Penny. Gets through some amount of work. Oosh. Unreal. You never like to be on the receiving end of one of those, do you? Definitely not. What do you think, Ian? I get the vote again, do I? You do, yeah. We're so uh, nice to you today. You're, you're welcome. We're not I, usually yeah, this nice. You're too nice. <laughs> um, I'll we'll probably go... Scott Penny's one. Scott Penny, the last one. The last one, yeah. And Paul Boyle. Um, I'm going to go for Ruin Nels. I just think shooting out the line and catching Mike Lowry like that, he's not an easy guy to catch. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'll go with Ruin Nels because, you know what, I was like, poor Mike Lowry is broken. Not that I don't want him <laughs> broken, but you know what I mean? He left an impact for Mike Lowry was maybe having a little tear on the ground. So exactly. I'll go with so, that. Uh, Ruin Nels wins the jukebox of the week. Yes, he does. So moving on. Now, ahead of the launch of this year's Aviva Mini Rugby Festival, Jason, who's unfortunately missing today, had the pleasure of speaking to Irish and Munster rugby legend and current head coach of La Rochelle, Ron O'Gara, and he first asked him about his verdict on Ireland's Six Nations campaign, but also the question on everyone's lips is, who's going to be Munster's next head coach? I think it's excellent, you know. I think we're very easy to, to, to not see uh, so many of the positives, and this team is full of positives. For me, this campaign is full of positives. I think... Did I read they scored 24 tries and conceded four? That's that's very, very good. I think the biggest plus for me is probably that you mean supporters, the public have identified a style of play with this team, which which seemed very pleasing. And that's very important that they're, I suppose, growing their fan base, growing, I suppose, people's admiration for how they're going about setting up to play that wasn't always the case and the fact that it was more driven by results and we're always driven by results but now you can see under this staff that there's this ambition to play and play the ball out of the tackle and, and just play the game a little bit differently and I suppose not passing the ownership to the players but giving the players ownership of how they want to prepare uh, and that sets, I think, smart because it responsive, puts responsibility on the players and, and makes them become accountable. Once you have accountability in any environment, it, it usually works out well for you because you get the best of the coaching staff, you get the best ideas of players, but it's them that's driving it. And, and that's essentially what happens when pressure comes on. You see that, okay, yeah, uh, you mean the leaders in my team are capable of making decisions under this stress, duress, pressure situation, are, and we run out of ideas, we become mentally frail, and we don't stick to task. Yeah, it's been a, it, there's been a bit of time since, I suppose, the announcement, but what's very important is that you get the right person, so they've obviously had mm, potentially one or two stumbling blocks. I don't know, because... I'm on the outside. I don't have contacts there that, that mark my card and these kind of things. So I'm completely uh, not up to speed on what's going on there. But uh, it has to be a hugely thorough process. There's there's a lot of good coaches in the world. There's a lot of I suppose it's important that, that the coach fits. I suppose with the with the identity of Monster and, and the Monster supporters. I think that's important too this time because uh, what hasn't changed when you tune in is that. The supporters are only dying to get in behind the team. It's fantastic still to see, you know, 10 years on from whatever near since I've left. It's, they just, they've got massive love for the game in Limerick and Limerick and, and, and they're just dying to, 
to get in behind their team. It's, it's great to see, but this appointment is very, very important because, um, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of threats to Munster rugby in the fact with Limerick hurling and, and you mean the strength of, of the GA and the strength of, of, of Leinster rugby that there needs to be a kickback for Munster over the next number of years. Lovely in-depth answer there by Rod, wasn't it? Yeah, I would have thought he might have been in the running. Yeah, love to see him head coach. Surely it's written in the stars for him to come back and coach for Munster. It is, I just wonder how long, like when is the right time for him. Obviously he's doing a job at La Rochelle there, he's doing a great job. And I know, I'm not a Munster fan, but I know you guys and like he bleeds Munster red and he wouldn't want to come back unless he's the full... Full shilling, yeah. He's the full shilling and yeah. he can actually make an impact and bring, bring Munster rugby where they should be historically yeah i'd say he's nice and comfortable over in la rochelle now as well, well the weather is bad <laughs> the paycheck's not bad anyway moving on uh some quick rugby news to finish up ireland the 20s uh tip of hat to them grand slam winners unreal result out of them congratulations congratulations to them uh obviously italy did very well in the under 20s as well dev toner um has retired a f friend of the show after how long has he played for leinster over 10 years jeez he's over 250 caps isn't he mm. amazing yeah. shift amazing for irish shift. rugby and also moana pacifica beat the hurricanes for the first time ever in super rugby so shout out to those guys as well and that's all we have time for guys uh thanks very much ian for coming in you were great Cheers. Thank you. I'll thank you, in. Lindsay. No, thank you. Um, and of course, a big thank you to our sponsors, Bank of Ireland, proud supporters of the four Irish provinces. Until next time, guys, thanks very much. Joe presents House of Rugby, United Rugby Championship, together with Bank of Ireland, proud supporter of the four Irish provinces.